Welcome. My name is Joe Davich, and I'm the director here at the Georgia Center for the Book. And on behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book, DeKalb County Public Library, the DeKalb Library Foundation, the Decatur Arts Alliance, the Downtown Decatur Development Authority, welcome to our third and final artist talk for The Book is Art, Volume 9, Muse. We are so very pleased to have you join us once again this evening for these very informative and illuminating artist talks. And we have three wonderful artists to talk about their pieces that are featured in the exhibition this year. Just a few things before we get started. After the formal presentation, if you would like to ask any of our panelists a question, feel free to do so by typing your question into the Q&A feature. You can find the Q&A button at the top or the bottom of the screen, depending on your device. We've also enabled live transcription for those individuals that need that due to hearing impairments. You can find the CC button at the top or the bottom of your screen. And once you click it, you can resize the text to make sure that you can easily read what's going on. So right now I'd like to begin by introducing our guests in alphabetical order and then turning it over to them to talk about these fascinating works. First is Anjaya Kuna. She is a multimedia artist focusing mainly on bookbinding and installation works. Anjaya's projects are biocentric to reconnect heritage, identity, and culture with nature. Themes of immigration, displacement, and the Pacific Island diaspora are explored as well. Anjaya graduated with a Bachelor of the Fine Arts from the Design Media Arts at UCLA, and she is currently based in Kona, Hawaii. She started Jaya Bound Studios in 2020 and works at the Donkey Mill Art Center as their bookbinding and papermaking director. In 1977, Fran Goodfriend completed a degree in women's studies and art from Western Washington University. She then moved to San Francisco, where she continued her arts education at San Francisco State College, City College of San Francisco, and Sun Valley Center for the Arts. She was also an apprentice at a local pottery studio and loved working with clay, hand building, and throwing pots. She focused on Reiku pottery, drawn to the calligraphic lines of the Japanese brushwork. Her sense of humor emerged in quirky clay sculptures decorated with cartoonish narratives. After holding several part-time jobs, she received an elementary teaching credential in 1990 and taught kindergarten in the Bay Area and overseas in Morocco, Taiwan, and Papua, Indonesia. Then she retired in 2002. The collages, drawings, paintings she created for the seven years overseas became the basis of artist books. Book art is now a way for her to rediscover her childhood love of reading. The starting point of the process is roaming through old books, which often determine the themes of her works. She currently lives in Santa Rosa, California, Sonoma County. She's exhibited works at the Sometimes Books and Gallery Route 1, Point Reyes Station, Sebastopol Center for the Arts, and 23 Sandy. Our final panelist this evening is Sarah Quinn. She is an educator and artist from Atlanta who is figuring out what place books have in our personal and collective liberation. She makes books for and with kids and with grown people who are trying to keep their hearts open. She teaches students to read and to make things that matter to them, plant their own seeds and harvest their own fruits. Her books use words and drawings and dreams and homemade inks to make space for seeking, feeling, unlearning and radical imagination. As you can see, we have a very diverse and powerful panel of women artists and we're so pleased to present them here this evening. So I'd like to welcome back Anjaya Kuna. Her work featured in the exhibition this year is called Half Leaf. Anjaya. Anjaya, you still may be muted. Hi. Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, so half leaf uh, in Hawaiian, it's called Ope'ape'a, which is the only native mammal of Hawaii. Um, it's a type of Howry bat. And so what inspired me to focus on it as uh, the theme of the form of my book was its mythical 
fantastical shape. I'm a sucker for fantasy, so it actually reminds me of a Hawaiian dragon. Um, although it doesn't have a lot of information about the Hauri bat because it's endangered, um, what we do know is that it's a nocturnal hunter of insects that sleeps in trees, um, which is the complete opposite of what people know about bats. They're usually sleeping in caves and um, eating fruits, but they're endangered because they're solo animals and with all the deforestation and the privatization of land here in Hawaii because of tourism, mainly resorts and uh, ranches and so forth, the mammal, the opiapa'a is, the, their population is decreasing. So that also heavily influenced the process of making the opiapa'a. Um, I wanted to make sure that all the materials I was using was upcycled from farms. So during that time, it was pruning season for Kona coffee farms here in Hawaii. Um, so the bone structure of the bat wing is actually Kona coffee tree branches. Um, the handmade paper was also, I harvested non-native plants here in Hawaii, mainly invasive and um, yeah, foreign plants. So the Djibouti kava tree is, was one of them. Um, some jackfruit as a binding agent to bind the paper pulp together. Um, I use some ma'o, which is actually a Hawaiian cotton plant, which is also endangered. Um, yeah, but I just mainly wanted to create a sustainable art piece and also having a conscious, sustainable art process. Um, and the fun part was experimenting with the form of the wing, um, the integrity of its name, half leaf. Uh, was inspired by its comparison to the incredibly important Hawaiian uh, taro root or kalo. The leaf is this heart-shaped leaf, um, which is why the Hawaiians call this haoribet, the opiapea, which translates to half leaf. Um, but anyway, I originally wanted to make the book like this, so when you opened it, it looked like a huge bat opening its wings and flying away, but I decided to stick with that half leaf, with a half body or just one wing. Um, and by using black handmade paper made from um, mango leaves, it just created this stark beige wing in contrast to a night black, but it's unfurling wing kind of gives us um, it's implicit of it waking up. So I wanted to create this like unfurling bony cocoon to really give a sense of um, the Howry bat. Um, and my book was also accompanied by a poem I wrote too, but I'm not gonna read it out loud, <laughs> but it should be on the website. Um, I'm also a poet, I'm a writer, uh, I've been bookbinding for six years, but I, it's never, I've gotten really obsessed with bookbinding because I've disco discovered its sculptural aspect to it, but also by creating journals or sketchbooks, um, it gives other people opportunity to um, add to the design of the book, the story of the book. They're gonna be the storytellers of this cradle that I made for them. Um, but thank you so much for inviting me to this Zoom artist talk. And I feel so uh, grateful to be part of this community of book artists. I was, I'm in Hawaii, so I didn't get to see the actual exhibition in person. And I'm sure, if, I, I really wish I could touch everything and smell everything, but um, the online exhibition was just as amazing. It still blew me away. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Anjaya. Um, you know, we, we try to give folks, you know, the best possible virtual experience like the people have when they walk into the gallery. Um, and just so you know, there's already comments for the poem that must be read. 
<laughs> sometime this evening. So we, we, we may have to nudge you about that. But thank you so very much for that. Next, of course, we would like to bring up Francine Goodfriend and her work that's in the exhibition this year is called Critical Stenosis. Fran? Okay, here I am. Hi. Um, I, if, again, I enjoyed the exhibition online. It was really great to see where the books are shown and I'm honored to have been invited. So I wanna thank you for all that. Um, I want to give you some background to critical stenosis before I put on the slides. Um, in 2016, late summer, I developed what is defined as a critical stenosis. It was in my neck. So basically, that's a narrowing of the vertebrae, and it, the, the vertebrae is pressing on the, the uh, nerves in your neck. And as you go higher up the spine, more bodily, complex bodily functions are in control of your movement or what, you know, breathing, if I broke my neck, which I didn't, I'm very happy to say. But anyways, I was, my diagnosis was progressive quadriparesis. And that's basically, I wasn't paralyzed, but if I didn't have surgery, I would have been eventually. And um, so I lost all independence basically with taking care of myself, cooking, cleaning, which I, cooking and cleaning, I didn't miss that much, but it was a hard time. And I had one hospitalization and I couldn't be diagnosed. So I got back home and I'm going to show you now what, how this book came up, uh, hopefully together. So here I go. And before I share with you, I need to get that going. And I, oops, sorry, 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 sorry. Okay. Share and play. So when I got I had created a pair, um, some playing cards in my book guild's workshop, and they were jet, uh, gessoed and then painted with acrylics and different painterly effects, spattering and, and using stencils and all kinds of way, ways of attempts at using them. And then when I got home, uh, back from the hospital, I pulled these cards out. And I cannot tell you now if this was conscious or unconscious move on my part, but I just started, I could had some fine motor skills and using the scissors, I cut figures out of women who were displaying some kind of athleticism or perform. I had a book from a Dover's book that uh, had circus performers from the turn of the 20th century. So I had these cards and I just willy nilly collaged figures on them. And I really, and then I got ahead my surgery and recovery. And then I pulled back these cards out and I started adding other images, which I thought of course, you can see like a column there and like a spinal column and she's kicking it, <laughs> the kicking the column there. And eventually I had a dancer that I had to, um, since she, the book, this book cover was large, I uh, scanned it and in Photoshop, I made it small enough to fit on the card. And this is a, uh, one of those iron-on decal transfers. So, and then I came up with the idea of critical stenosis. And when I show you the, the final product, I'll talk a little more about that. But here she is. And I had started adding medical illustrations. And I worked these cards so much, they began to look like rock to me. They had so much. The texture was great, but they, like in a lot of my process, 
sometimes it would never make it to a, in a book. And there, I had originally, in the other cards I showed, I had a Coptic binding. I, there was holes in because originally I made a Coptic binding and then I decided I didn't want to do that. So here's the cover of the book. And um, I don't even know if I said this before, but I'll say it again. It was 12 page accordion book. And I printed on a digital uh, cotton fabric that could be printed in an inkjet printer. And I, I have done other forms of textile art in terms of the books. And I like how vivid the co colors come through in textiles. And also, you know, since this was a dark subject for me, I thought I want lots of color besides the movement, because I was, you know, against my own paralysis. You know, I was trying to contrast these things. And critic, the terminology critical stenosis popped into my head. And many years ago, I was a medical secretary. And that was a term I typed up a lot. And I thought, well, I don't even, not clear what that means. And the doc, and even, I don't even think the doctors really said that to me and the, when I had my appointments. So I, I went back to, and through my medical records and I looked at all this, I looked at all the, um, I pulled out all the words that I thought would relate to what was happening to me. And then the other thing, is, um, I was looking at, because I was using circus performers and dancers, I was, I started find, bending the fonts or making them into a wavy pattern. I felt that um, with, I felt, you know, again, that has to do with a circus or presenting. And um, I'm not sure if you can see over here and I don't know how to move it. I, there's something on the bottom under the joker that says systemic peril. Well, often when you reading medical reports that stenosis is connected to systemic failure. So I didn't want to put failure. I thought a uh, systemic peril was a better term. And then this next is like, okay, featuring the symptoms, like when you have um, trapeze artists, there are always some family, family names. So this is, and these are the symptoms I went through. I'm not gonna define them so much. And you know, when I was thinking, this is weirding me out a little, when I was thinking about this artist talk, I'm looking at this one page of neuropathy, atrophy and weakness, and, there's a, the, the original picture did have the, um, ac, the trapeze artist connected to a pole. And I thought, oh my God, they put a rod in my neck. So it really is, you know, that's kind of like another unconscious thing that popped up in numbness, tingling, pain, spasticity. And so, oh, and this is ataxia. Ataxia is when you lose your ability, the nervous system, the central nervous systems can, is not, your muscles are not receiving the right stitches to um, move to, or your sense of balance. It's very easy to fall over. So, and I remember when I first had the symptoms, I'm walking to my car and weaving and I and this woman's kind of looking at me or I was paranoid to think she was and I had to tell her I'm not a drunk driver. So um and here's the last pages neurosurgery and recovery and I, I felt it was important to define my terms and so I I printed them up on really old paper to go with the rest of the book. And this is the back of the book. And uh, I, you know, that 
the back cover is very close to the card that I collage, the original card. And, you know, sometimes I, you lose texture with d digital work. But on this case, I felt like it came through. You know, it has some depth. And um, I like the mark to use these old marble end papers. And um, because and this one especially reminded me of core puzzles. And then growing when I was growing up in the 60s, there in the my parents' cyclopedia, there was the invisible man or visible man or invisible man and woman. And they were layered acetate pages and showing the different levels of a person's anatomy. And the pages between, I have, of course, this woman and there's a, a man at the other end. And uh, the pages I used in between are from old encyclopedias. So, you know, I think the important part of uh, this book was that I kind of, my way of dealing with hard times in my own life is some humor and hospitalizations can be very bizarre. And I came, came home and I would tell my friends stories of what happened and we would, would just all end up laughing because it was so weird. And uh, so that's basically the book. And, you know, and it's, I think another thing that was important part was for years, I took part in writing process groups or writing practice. And it, you know, when you go through that process, you remove yourself a little bit eventually from your own angst. And for me, that helped me communicate this kind of paralysis, but it wasn't and, you know, oh, this happened to me and it was really bad. It's more like, it's not really a poem because I'm not a poet, but I played with the rhythm of the language. So thank you so much. And I am going to try to stop my piece here. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so very much, Fran, for sharing not only the story about your wonderful piece of art, but your personal story with us as well. And now, of course, we'd like to turn our attention to the third presentation this evening. Um, the only presenter on the East Coast currently, and we are happy to very, very say, an Atlanta. So I would like to welcome Sarah Quinn to talk about her work, Go Inside. Sarah? Hey, thank you. Um, it's been so wonderful seeing y'all's presentations and just seeing all the just all the depth that goes into every single piece. A book is so complex and I love seeing all the layers behind it. Um, I'm just gonna share, I'm gonna share like digital slides of the book um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about it. But first I would just like to read it aloud to y'all. Um, I'm also a teacher. Fran, I was glad to hear you were a teacher too. And Jay, I wonder if you do, I'd love to talk about this a little bit of teaching at your studio. It kind of seems like when I was looking around what y'all do. But anyway, as a teacher, um, got to do some read aloud. So going to share my book, Go Inside. And this was produced in a residency I did at the Women's Studio Workshop, um, which is up in New York State. Really recommend everybody to check out Women's Studio Workshop, which offers amazing residencies and workshops for women and trans folks. Um, if I can get my slide to change. There we go. So this is an unlearning book for kids and grownups. The story that students, especially minoritized students, have something wrong with them runs deep. My work as a teacher is not to fix or change. I am learning how to tell a different story to myself and my students. One of my kindergartners once showed me a drawing and told me, this is the cave inside my mind. I go in there to get my ideas. Just, just like so cool. Um, what wonders are already inside of her? What is already inside of you? You sit each behind the other. We tell you how to hold yourselves, where to put your eyes, what should fill your mind. You don't have a question. 
which is something I've heard teachers say um, to kids at schools I've worked at. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it makes you feel like your insides are empty sometimes, but there is a part of you underneath that none of this can reach. That's where you go inside. And if you guys could see the physical book, this is a two part binding. So this first one is a drum leaf and the second one is an accordion that pulls out. So you can kind of see it here. Go inside your own darkness where you think you can't fit. In the open cavern, listen for something living, follow it. Use your hands, your mouth to find the river and a boat just for you. Drift through the dark to a place where you can feel everything growing. You want to see it all, but you don't know how. You can fill it with light, your own light. Go inside the garden and taste everything. Lay down when you're ready, go to sleep, let it all go. Later when you remember, you will feel lit from within. You will know there is no secret thing outside of you. You are the secret thing welling up from inside, overflowing. So the book that, um, this book came about through kind of me processing my experiences as a teacher. I taught in New Orleans um, as well as in Nashville and now I'm teaching here in Atlanta. And uh, just really, processing a lot of my traumatic experiences and my powerful experiences and trying to figure out, well, what story do I wanna tell my students and how do I navigate guiding them and also letting them lead the way? And, and what is that like as a white teacher uh, who's primarily worked with black students and brown students? Um, what is my role? What is my place? And like, what story do I have to offer them that allows them to actually be their own storyteller. So this was a book designed to share with kids and it was also designed to share with adults um, because I think there's a lot of learning in that overlap. And just to share with y'all, I created the text for this book and some of the ideas for images um, while I was teaching fourth grade at uh, J.E. Moss Elementary in Nashville. And I did some workshops with my students there, my fourth graders to talk about like what, how do they imagine their inside spaces and the place where they can go inside themselves that is up to them. That is, they have complete um, dominion. And so these are just some images of my students and the work they created. And these are some images of some of their places. This one was like this dope rainbow canyon with like shining crystal. I just loved this so much that Carlos did. And then this one was like multiple lakes under each other with like exits like secret doors underneath and these incredible vehicles at the bottom. I just I loved that um so many of them connected with the idea of like entry and portals and like descending and that sort of like transformative space um that was just really powerful to me um and here's one more Gian's had this like deep deep darkness and then this sudden light that was really inspiring for me and her waterfall um, and here's a second waterfall um, again, covered in crystals and gemstones. I loved seeing the connections that they made and sort of like, of course, our inner landscapes are so unique, but also there are some things that often connect back to the earth, to natural beauty, to the things that are most like awe-inspiring in our human experience um, that they had in common. And then just a few slides of me making the book. I had to learn to screen print to make this book. Normally my process is a lot more drawing. Um, I use a lot of natural inks that I make with like foraged plants. So Jay, I was so, so like moved by your descriptions of working with forage materials. Um, so it was really hard to work with like pre-mixed inks and to learn screen printing and Women's Studio Workshop supported me a lot. Um, but the screen printing process for making images, you know, it was just a different way of working and it kind of led to this sort of more like dreamlike suspended space um, than I normally would work with. And then also wanted to show, I got to work with some students while I was up there. So got to learn by teaching and, and teach by learning. Um, and just wanted to show like how many, this was an addition book, which I hadn't worked in this big of an addition before with handmade books. Um, and finally, I don't know if this video will play, but I, all of the text is, was handset by me um, and letterpress printed. So just like another 
you know, for those who may not be familiar with book arts, love to show like the beautiful machines. I can see NJ, you guys have something in the back over there, um, some kind of letter press or, or press that you guys have going on. But just like to share that with folks who might not be as familiar with book arts. So I'm not gonna, y'all don't need to see this video right now. Um, yeah, so that's what I have to share today. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so very much, Sarah. That was a wonderful, wonderful presentation and actually gives me all the fodder we need to start this wonderful discussion this evening as well. So I told you I was going to be on that. So I was vigorously taking notes. Once again, if any of you in the audience would like to ask the artist questions, please feel free to type those in the Q&A portion and we'll answer those as they come in. But one thing I, I did want to touch on, and we'll go back to Anjaya real quick, because she, of course, as Sarah mentioned, is in a very interesting location right now, and I would love for her to tell us all where she's at and give them a shout out. Am I live? <clears throat> yes, you are. Okay, uh, I'm in Kona, Hawaii, currently at the Donkey Mill Art Center, uh, which is in Holualoa. It's uh, around 2000 uh, elevation, um, but I could see the seaside and from the stretch from the seaside to the desert is jungle and then another desert mountain <laughs> above me. Um, it's almost two o'clock here, so it probably will start raining. Um, rains here every single day, but it's incredibly sunny in the morning incredibly hot. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'm just surrounded by jungle. <laughs> well, well, you, we here in Georgia know what it's like for really, really hot. Um, granted, it's been a little more forgiving this summer, but um, it's been a, a scorcher or two in the past few years. But so what do you all do at the Donkey Root Art Center? Uh, we mainly provide um, classes, art classes to a wide range of uh, demographics. And then we also provide art classes in public schools here. Um, and the center itself also has uh, an exhibition space um, and different types of studios from pottery, uh, metal, printmaking, and our new fiber studio. Excellent, that sounds wonderful. And maybe let's, let's go ahead and, and bring Sarah in on another topic that I found very interesting because Sarah, you talked about using forage plants and natural materials. And Anjaya, you know, your book, you know, Ape Ape A ah, just is literally created from the surroundings that you live in. And it, I found it utterly fascinating. And I even loved it more when I, you said that those were Kona um, coffee twigs that were in there because I'm a confirmed coffee fan. So like, oh, that's, that's, that's even better, um, <laughs> those are, are coffee twigs. But how important is it for you both? And what, what is it as an artist that um, drove you to really use those natural materials, those natural dyes as like your form of expression rather than, you know, something that is, um, you know, sort of like traditionally like, you know, oils or, or, you know, alkyds, something like that, that, that you know, can be sourced in, in like a, a, an art store, art supply store. Should I go first? Go right ahead. Okay. Um, have you ever heard the term ignorance is bliss? I, well, I don't have it anymore. So <laughs> there's this heavy guilt, especially in such a delicate environment here in Hawaii. Um, humanity is very intertwined with nature, um, especially here, as opposed to you know other places like Los Angeles, there's a stark lifestyle difference in the city or the suburbs and the desert. There's no connection between um, how easily we can intertwine with nature instead of separating it uh, from us as like a nuance. So here in Hawaii, I feel like it's important and uh, it's, it's very important and necessary to be, to observe, to listen, to um, 
be conscious of what you're surrounded by, your actions and how that's going to affect the next step, uh, affect the next village, for example. Um, I guess the best metaphor I have here is it's incredibly steep um, on the island of Hawaii. So if you live at like 2000 elevation and you're gonna spray a bunch of, you know, weed killer on your farm, all that rainwater is gonna take all that um, terrible toxic chemicals to the houses below you and then eventually the ocean. So not to be corny, but you know, it's the circle of life. Um, and with art, um, artists have this entrepreneurship that they are, they can fit into any norm in the sense that um, I wanna use my artwork, but also my process to inspire uh, different norms here on the island, whether it's farming or education, uh, building, uh, food, culinary, whatever. Excellent. Thank you, Anjaya. Sarah, how about you? I'm just taking that in. Um, for this book, I mean, this book, like, I really failed to do that. Like, Anjaya, like, your that path you're creating and that collaboration with the plants and with, like, a way of living and being, like, that is where I'm hoping to grow towards. And, like, I've been slowly you know, figuring out what that looks like for me. Um, Cause yeah, when you look, you're like, okay, where'd this paper come from? Where'd these inks come from? If you've ever been in a printing studio and you've cleaned the equipment, you can smell that like, you're not, we're not supposed to be doing that. We're not, supposed, we're not, I mean, you know, and that, I, you know, we could talk all day about that, but, um, and so like for this particular book, it was kind of like, okay, I'm in these circumstances. How do I, but I find that um, when I'm working with like, and this is just kind of a different, but when I'm working with creative colors, I kind of feel like I have like big thick gloves on or something. Like I find it difficult to express with those colors and like connect with those colors. And when I'm working with forage materials, things just like flow in a different, it feels different to like the creative shift, the creation process feels different to me. And so like I'm working on learning. I want to I'm working on like building up my library and my repertoire of, of even just like inks to start so that I can work more directly um, and expressively with like what's around me. And it's been cool. So I am from Atlanta, I grew up here and I've lived away all of my like adult life. And now at 32, I've moved back and I'm like finding all these plants that I never knew were here. So like there's wild grapes everywhere in Atlanta. I never knew that. And so I've been working with a lot of wild grapes. I've been working with um, the goldenrod. Like I'm finding, I'm learning the place here in a way that I never, I didn't know it as a child um, and I didn't see or value, but it's like these plant relationships are here too, even in this huge metropolis with like the craziest highways ever. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. That, very interesting. One of our artists last week did the work, um, Meza Karaize. And she was talking about her process of, of you know, creating the dyes and the colors from the natural environment. And um, even some of the fabrics that she used, she buried them in the ground to let them rot. Oh yeah, well, and then the, what, I, you know, you read the book descriptions, but then sometimes you, you miss things. And I completely missed the fact that there were actually um, fungi spores in the book. Um, and then you, I just had that moment and I, I said it in last week's discussion that, oh yeah, I can see, you know, maybe, you know, the Emory Book Arts Library buying this. And like, how do they handle that there are live, you know, fungal spores implanted in this book for a reason? Because she, you know, once, if, you know, once that sense of impermanence that eventually the book will return to something natural and will decompose that way. So, I, you know, I find that extremely fascinating. Before I like loop Fran in here real quick, Anjaya, the, the black of the book where you said you used mango leaves, is that, does the black color come from the mango leaf that you used? No, no. Okay. Excellent, thank you so very much. Well, Fran, I wanna loop you in here um, because, you know, Sarah kind of created this book using a process that she, she never did. 
um, but you kind of truly have sort of like a, a transformed or altered book of the, of the three folks here. What's it like for you to source those materials? You know, do you have an idea and kind of like wait for the material to present itself to you? Or is it one of those things where, you know, you find an object and then it sparks your ideas? Well, it's both. Sometimes I go searching for books and those are usually reference books because they, you know, I'll go to the, I used to go to the, you know, um, used bookstores or whatever. And I was looking for books with the letter E because I was, I was making a book about X, the uh, uh, solar summer, the equinox. And, and sometimes something will pop up like that ballerina popped up to the ballet. And I thought this is too good to pass, pass up. So it's a combination of both. And, you know, and if I have these huge dictionaries here from the thirties, the twenties, I can just pull it out or the marbled end papers. I just bought this whole set of Dickens novels where the person hadn't even cut the pages. You know, they were from like the late 1890s. They weren't valuable in terms, of, but to me, they were valuable and I held on to it. And eventually I found, you know, I just go leafing through things and find it, find what I want. I very rarely go searching for a, an image. And also the way I'm working, sometimes I destroy what I'm working on unintentionally. And I've learned to just say, okay, don't, you know, don't get crazy about this because there's others in it. There, I'll find more images. It, there, it seems like it's endless, but something I've learned, they say, oh, if you're recycling, you know, artists are recycling books or books that are going to be thrown away. And it still creates trash on some form, on some level of my work, you know, even if I re put in the recycling bin, it creates. And, and like Sarah talked about working with the inks in the letterpress studio. And, you know, so I become more aware of how I handle, I let the materials and I let the acrylic, I don't, pour the acrylic paints down the drain anymore. So that's basically it, I guess. Well, you know, it, it seems like you all are, are very conscious about that as well within all of your works. And it seems though that there's a whole theme too that you all have a process of learning but unlearning at the same time. Um, you know, I, I think Sarah really brought that, that out, but you know, as I was listening this evening, it was like, oh, you know, we, we, you know, we're learning about this bat and then we kind of have to unlearn what we have to, what we've thought about or how we, you know, may have used and abused the environment and how that impacts those things. Or, you know, students in a classroom and, you know, having to unlearn, you know, things that we teach them that we were taught because we think that that's the way to go. Um, but I do have to say, Sarah, I, loved your students artwork and those imaginations are unbelievable there are countless numbers of authors who would probably kill to have that kind of imagination for world building in some of their novels i mean they were absolutely <laughs> fantastic and it does sound like you were you were pretty much gobsmacked by them Is, has there been any time where you've just um looked at your students work being a teaching artist and just you know were, were gobsmacked into silence Totally. And so I have like some of it sometimes, you know, cause they make all this stuff and they're just like, and sometimes I'm like, Hey, can I, can I have that? <laughs> and I have like one of my uh, kindergartners from mod made this print. It's like right up there that I was like, Hey babe, like it's a print. Like, can I have one of those? And I have it framed. They're just so cool. They really make the coolest stuff. And when I work with adults as a teacher, I'm curious, Andrea, like, I feel like there's you know, if they don't like identify as an artist, it's like, oh, um, so getting, you know, I think this message I like 
of my book was like, Hey, for kids, like, let's make stuff. Let's see what's in your imagination. But I think adults need it very, very badly. Um, need that kind of like healing, um, to make progress in this world. Oh, it's definitely. That, that, that's kind of like what triggered that my whole thought process on the learning and unlearning thing that I'm seeing here. And, you know, you all seem to be teaching folks and working in teaching environments or have worked in teaching environments. And, um, you know, I, I think you all may have windows into the world that some of the casual viewers tonight and myself don't have um, because, you know, you get to kind of see all of that creativeness sort of like nascent before we, we you know, pigeonhole us into majors and things like that. And then, you know, send us off into the world. Um, so Fran, I wanna go back to, to you and the acrylics because I really liked, there is a great sense of movement to your book too, especially how you have the type in curves and, um, you know, it, it kind of moves you along. It, it's almost like you can actually hear the circus music playing behind it a little bit. But what struck me about it is, although these are such comical images, um, there's really a power behind them. Like, in, I'm glad you mentioned the one of, of the, the woman on the rod, because when I saw that, I immediately thought, oh, it's very Frida Kahlo. And how Frida Kahlo would always oh, do wow. yeah. the columna rota kind of thing, you know, and that was, I don't want to say it was her shtick, but, you know, she always made a big thing. She was in a terrible accident. It broke her back and she actually did have a rod that pierced her body, but, you know, she used it then as a complete metaphor in a lot of her paintings the rest of her life. And it kind of stops you and you have to really, you know, it's a very arresting moment in your book. Um, and I'm glad you brought that up this evening because I was like, yeah, that's, that's, a very powerful feminine image, I think. Well, you know, when I started in women's studies in art, it's mm -hmm. when Frida Kahlo was very, 1977, six, that's when she started becoming popular. Mm -hmm. In fact, my little neighbor was wearing a dress the other day and um, I, I commented on the cult, the, the color of it and my other six, seven year old neighbor came out and she said, oh, that's Frida Kahlo. <laughs> and I thought, wow, you know, this whole, <laughs> you know, 30, 40 years, whatever, some Frida Kahlo is in, or being taught in first grade or second grade and, or her mother's reading books to her about Frida Kahlo. And, until you brought it up, I didn't even think of this connection. And, but I think, you know, I mean, I consider that a compliment. So thank you. <laughs> you're, you're very First time in my life compared to Frida Kahlo. <laughs> well, folks, once again, we're, we're approaching the top of the hour. And I wanted to just remind you, if you had any questions for our artists, feel free to type those into the Q&A so we can um, get those asked before we wrap up this evening. Um, and Anjaya, I'm just once again putting it out there. I, I do have a poem pulled up, uh, but I know folks have asked for it. Um, so you know, <laughs> if you are uncomfortable with it and you would um, you know, give me the permission to, I, I think I would actually like to close with that if we wrap up this evening. Um, I am a big lover of poetry, I am sure Everybody who knows the Georgia Center for the Book and has seen our programs knows that I fight tooth and nail for poetry. So I would like to very much include that in the program, if you don't mind, whether you read it or I read it, um, your choice. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I don't mind reading it. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you don't mind, I would, if you, I can, I would love to read that. Maybe you should read it. Okay, okay, all right. We'll leave that for the very, very end, just in okay. case. Uh, hey, you, you're, you're a published poet. It's, it's almost like um, slam poetry. They always call the first person up the sacrifice poet. Um, they kind of like warm up the audience and, and things yeah. like that. So it's almost like being a sacrifice poet, um, but in a little bit of a <laughs> way. Um, so 
one thing that I, I really liked about all three of these works and kind of um, how they individually interconnected to each other in really interesting ways this evening is, you know, we started off with Anjaya's and, um, you know, it's so natural and that bat wing just seems to wrap around and embrace the book. And, um, you know, Franz was very transformative, but it seemed in a way that, you know, there was this great connection to uh, materials and digging beneath the surface and, and looking either into yourself, um, you know, beyond physical brokenness, beyond environmental brokenness, um, to produce the, these beautiful and contemplative pieces. So, you know, going forward, you know, what is what is the next step for you all? What are what are you working on and you know, how are you going to continue to express that uh, in maybe the pieces that you're working on now? Um, I've been wanting to dip my toe in curating and there, I've only seen one book arts exhibition here in Hawaii, but there, there's a sprinkle of book artists here um, and also in Honolulu. So uh, I'd like to initiate that sometime uh, really soon, hopefully. <laughs> well, it's actually a very, very rewarding experience. And if you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email and I will- yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> Fran, what about you? What are you working on currently? Now, I mean, I am, I work very slow now because I still have some disability, but I am, um, so I have this, I have so many things waiting to be finished, but I, right now I'm working on a book. It's not a book. It, I use part. I'm collaging from books, but it's a uh, encaustic piece. And I used to work a lot, my, the theme was bees. <laughs> now I'm moving on to um, butterflies and moths. And mm -hmm. also that format, I, that format I worked on with uh, critical stenosis, I found uh, in a, early 20th century encyclopedia, the language incredible how they talked about insects. Like they made them so um, human, like the line that really grabbed me was an intelligent fly um, carries his proboscis downward. <laughs> and so <laughs> I thought that that language was so, and you know there were other parts of those that book so I finished just finished a book and it's called flowers and insects a sewn poem and when COVID hit I had a lot of time to start practicing embroidery so I use the embroidery as a form throughout that book oh that sounds absolutely fascinating well thank you <laughs> Excellent. We, we, we may hope to see that in an exhibition in the future. Sarah, what are you working on currently? That's so cool, Fran. I just am thinking about, I just told a kid the other day, they were like trying to kill a moth. And I was like, no, 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 we don't kill moths. I was like, moths are pollinators. They're wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. We talked about moths. So what, they were like, okay, wish I hadn't asked, but um, I'm it's so I've been back to school um, and COVID is still going on. I'm here in Georgia. Um, so it's been very intense. It's been hard for me to like carve out time for my practice. But when I do have time early in the morning, I'm collaborating with some friends on a TV show for children um, that is going to be wow. around different themes. Right now we're working on an episode about like crying and water. There's going to be one about breathing. So sort of different um, themes kind of like, yeah, we, yeah, we're still working on what that's going to be, but I'm working on creating some, you know, working in a video format, which I've never done. So that's kind of cool. Well, that sounds very interesting, actually. Well, folks, we are about out of time. And since I said we were going to end with the poem, I want you all to thank yous real quick. So 
Thank you once again, Anjaya and Fran and Sarah for joining us. Thank you all at home so very much for joining us for this entire series. And don't forget that you can still sign up to view the gallery in person by going to our Eventbrite page. We are open Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays, and we'll have extended viewing hours the first weekend in October during the book festival. So be sure to check that out. Don't forget, you can also see the video tour of the gallery on our YouTube channel, and you can see the full catalog on the Book is Art website. So to end this evening, I would love to read this beautiful poem by our artist this evening, Anjaya Kuna. Daydreaming upside down in the trees, paper thin wings stretch into half loops. The roosting beast slowly reveals its eyes, waking up to the silver lit moonrise. But before the hunter's hungry flight, its bones pop up from the silver sliver of sunlight. Blood streams pump like halo veins. It drops from its tree and flutters in the rain. Not a myth and not a ghost, but close to a tale at most. The hoary bat dwindles in numbers, a contender for another Hawaiian wonder. Thank you all so very much for joining us this evening, and we'll see you all again very, very soon. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you so much.